All right, I think it's about time. 10 o'clock whistle just went off. Uh, thanks for everybody for joining us. Uh, hopefully you can hear me well. It is uh, raining sideways up here in Marysville. Welcome to fall, right? Um, I'm Trevor Cameron, our general manager here at Sunnyside. Uh, we're going to talk about plants for fall with the interest today. Uh, say hi to Nicole. She'll be in the office there uh, managing all the chat and the questions. Um, just making sure uh, everybody, we, uh, we, we thank you for joining us today. Um, everybody's got the sheets. I'm hoping we have them on the website. You've got a kind of fall winter interest plant list. Uh, there's a lot of good plants on there. There's quite a few things that could be on there. Um, just remember this isn't everything. There's a lot of good uh, choices here for uh, fall winter interest in the garden. Um, you know, I've been doing this 30 years here this year, and probably the number one question I get every year is, how do I make my yard look good every single season? Um, easiest question to that is come down to Sunnyside once a month and pick something out that looks nice. That always works. But uh, certainly, speaking as a nurseryman, you know, I'm not home as much in the spring as I am in the winter. So I have a lot of plants that I enjoy viewing here for fall color, for twig color, for bark interest. A lot of berries in the yard this time of year. Uh, nothing's cooler to me than going home, uh, getting out of my truck in the front yard there and watching the birds pecking away at my cranberry bush. Um, all the changes of, of the foliage right now. Um, and certainly this is the time of year when you're going to see a lot of the evergreens. You know, as the perennials go dormant, things go get uh, get down for the winter. You know, what do you have left to look at all through this all through the the, the, the winter months? Twig structure, branch structure, uh, evergreen foliage, different colors, different textures. Um, there's certainly some great plants we'll show you today here on the slideshow. Uh, maybe give you a couple ideas and some things to add to your yard. Um, if I was to give you one tip for fall color, it's already started here with me. I got about 10 phone calls slash emails last week. You know, why did my maple turn yellow and brown? You know, why do I drive up Highway 2 and see the native vine maples with the brightest orange, the brightest yellow. And I have one in my yard and it turns yellow brown every year. Um, the key is water. And I, I hate to tell you a lot of the gardeners water their yard too much. Um, you know, I shut off watering probably a good month, six weeks ago now at my house, watering containers, you know, dry things, that's fine. But as far as running your sprinkler systems or saturating your soil, if we shut the water down a little bit, you know, late August, early September, and let our gardens kind of harden off and go natural, you're gonna get far superior fall color. You know, if you're getting a lot of yellows to quick browns and not seeing the vibrant colors that you see in neighbor's yards or driving around town, uh, maybe turn the water down just a little bit here late summer and I think we'll get a little better color. Um, you know, we are in fall. You can hear the greenhouse, the rain beating on the greenhouse roof here. But, uh, you know, fall is for planting time. You know, this is the time of year uh, that you can get a lot of things done in the yard, get a head start for spring. We've got warm soil. Uh, we've still got a lot of rain coming down, so you don't have to worry about watering. Um, and, you know, certainly getting things established right now is going to give you the benefit of being that much farther ahead uh, come next summer, okay? So as I mentioned, hopefully you've got the handout. Um, it is on the website. Um, if you want to kind of follow through and, and make some notes as, as we look at some plants here. Um, if you did not get it or you can't find it on the website, just shoot us an email. Um, I'll be in the office here after the class uh, hiding from the downpour, and I will certainly email you a copy of it if you uh, let me know, okay? So we'll get going and looking at some pictures. Um, you know, we'll start with just a couple conifers. Um, you know, conifers to me are the backbones of the garden. You know, I'm going to have a specific conifer class. Uh, coming up here on October 24th, if you want to join me, and we will do nothing but conifers. But just to show you maybe a couple of my favorites um, and some of the color possibilities, um, we've got Chief Joseph Pine there, uh, one of the kind of holy grail conifer plants to most gardeners. You know, that's a green pine all summer long. You know, you would not think that's yellow at all. And as we get colder towards the frost here, it turns electric yellow for the whole winter time. Then we get back into spring, goes back to green again. So that's a great variety of lodgepole pine. Likes it hot, likes it dry, doesn't grow too awful fast. And something you can prune a little bit and keep pretty tidy in the yard. 
you'll see uh, the icebreaker tree and fir there. Uh, that's a very small dwarf one, almost looks like a little flock Christmas tree. Silver curled needles, uh, nice tidy structure, just a couple of feet tall, maybe three feet wide, and grows extremely slow. Um, that's another one, as long as we have good drainage and a pretty good sun location, that's an easy little plant to grow. A uh, couple ones with some color. Uh, everybody probably recognizes Arbor Vitae. You know, we use those as hedge material, a lot of options in the landscape. There's some very colorful ones like Fire Chief. You know, that's one that's going to have a nice orangey, limey, yellow cast all through the winter. It doesn't get super big, something I can prune into a nice round shape. But certainly, I love orange myself. I'll tell by the shirt here. If you can, uh, if you like that color in the yard, uh, go ahead and do a little, you know, a little planting of those in full sun. You'll have a nice, easy color, nice texture as well. Uh, Japanese cedar uh, is the other one there, one called Little Champion. Um, you know, I'll show you some more cryptomerias of the conifer class, but I don't know if a lot of gardeners utilize those in the Northwest. They're great plants in our garden, super hardy, very interesting texture. You know, we can get cryptomerias that some of them turn purples in the winter, bronzes in the winter, Little Champions one that will stay pretty green, but if you look at that plant, it's got very ropey, interesting texture. That's a very nice plant. I have one in my yard that you probably wouldn't even notice again, most of the growing season as the perennials and other plants are up and doing their thing. Once everything goes dormant again, now I can enjoy the texture of that guy over the winter months. Uh, a few little evergreen plants here. Uh, both these are blueberries, believe it or not. And uh, most people do northern highbush blueberries. They would be turning, you know, electric red right now. Yes, we get good fruit on all the blueberries to enjoy to eat, uh, but some of them have great foliage as well. You know, blueberries turn great fall color. These two particular ones, uh, Bountiful Blue, Pink Icing. There's also Sunshine Blue. Uh, those are three, uh, three varieties that we would get, A, some great berries on them to enjoy mid-late summer for eating, and B, in our mild northwest winters, they typically don't go dormant like, like other highbush blueberries. So I've got purples and reds, uh, turquoise, some really nice foliage colors to enjoy through the winter months. Yes, if we get cold, they might end up dropping their leaves, but boom, right back out in spring, we've got the foliage back and off we go for another season. Uh, this is a plan I debated whether to put on the slideshow or not, to, to be honest with you. Um, Grevillea is not for everybody. You know, if we're down near the water, uh, we've got a nice sheltered yard, good hot sun, Grevillea will be okay. But I would caution you uh, to look at your particular little microclimate and look at the variety you're purchasing. We tend to get a couple different varieties of Grevilleas off and on. I think I've got one around right now. It's not an easy plant to find, but that's a plant that depending on your variety could be low, could be big and shrubby. Um, and that blooms in the dead of winter. That's a great hummingbird plant. Um, I usually keep one in a pot at my place so that it maybe if we get cold, I can tuck it up against the house or protect a little bit over the winter. Um, but I see a lot of them around in landscapes. Um, you know, if we're up in the hills here, you know, probably not the best choice for you um, as far as hardiness, but most grevilleas will be in that zone eight. There are a few zone sevens around, but certainly worth a look. Um, if you like the winter bloom, it would be a great one to keep the hummingbirds happy. Um, I put a couple barberries on here. Um, you know, this would be at the tail end of winter. So if we fast forward all the way till like next March, you know, I guess technically uh, spring solstice is not till the 21st. So these would be blooming, you know, kind of that late winter, very early spring. Uh, Darwin barberry, warty barberry are both evergreens. Uh, they'll get a little bit of foliage color on the green in the winter. You can see the thorns on there. I always kind of chuckle. I have two young boys. That will be planted underneath my bedroom window at some day, so we can't have any boys escaping in the middle of the night. But uh, certainly something that uh, will give you some great late winter flower. The orange on Darwin's or the, the yellow on the warty barberry, certainly some bright flower colors. Uh, a couple of plants that are really starting to bloom about right now uh, Camellia sasanqua, a uh, plant you can find in a number of different colors. Uh, we've got pinks, we've got whites, we've got reds, we've got variations of all those. Um, you know, sasanqua is a useful plant if you've got that part shade, part sun. You're looking for a nice evergreen shrub. It can be pruned. Um, they grow up, 
you know, some are a little bit lower, maybe in the four or five foot range. Um, some other ones will get up maybe seven or eight feet as they get older, but some, we can certainly prune. Uh, just a quick trick with the camellias, a lot of people will purchase them. Ours are covered in flower buds. Then they'll call back next winter and say, why didn't I get a lot of bloom? You know, be real careful with camellias over the summer. That's a plant that likes a little bit of water. And if we get drought stressed, <coughs> excuse me, or dry out a little bit, um, it will not produce flower buds. So a good feeding on a camellia, you know, late spring will get you a nice bud set over the summer that you will get to enjoy that fall. So not quite blooming yet, but typically again, the, the, the Sisenko type camellias will start coming out late October, November, and then into December as well. The other picture on there, strawberry tree. I think everybody knows or, or has noticed our native madrones. We've got real pretty red bark that exfoliates a little bit, big trees. Strawberry tree is a relative of that um, with a similar bark texture, maybe a little smaller structure, but something right now, our plants out in the nursery look just like that. They are in flower uh, late summer into fall. Then we get those strawberry fruits on there uh, for wildlife and for winter interest over the, over the holidays. Um, it's not a strawberry, it's a totally different plant. Uh, they're not poisonous or anything. They don't taste very good. I've tried a couple times, but uh, but certainly a plant worth looking at. That love sun will give you some height. You know, honestly, if you've got patience and watch it grow for years, that could be a small evergreen tree. You know, maybe it gets up there in that 10 to 12 foot range as we as we grow up. A uh, couple more broadleaves: uh, Sundance Mexican Orange or Choicea. Uh, that's a plant that would bloom in May or June and have white fragrant flowers, but I really enjoy the foliage over the winter. If, if I've got a lot of shade and I plant that, it's got a very nice shiny lime green color to it, uh, particularly over the winter. If I've got a little bit of sun or part sun, I will have some yellow or some gold. But a really nice shrub for kind of filler. It's got great texture and foliage color that doesn't get super big. You know, most choices get up maybe chest level, four or five foot, that spread out a little bit more as they develop. But again, something that's very easy to prune. Um, the other one on there is, there's some fabulous Nandinas around these days. You know, before we were kind of stuck with old, leggy, upright Nandina, which certainly has its place in the landscape for height and for background. But I want a Nandina that I can put on the shrub border and enjoy the color. So a lot of these new ones like Bonfire, uh, there's a number of other ones out there it will give me the color I want on the foliage, be really easy evergreen and aren't going to grow much more than say three feet by three feet. Something I can prune if I want, but very drought tolerant, very easy to grow. And to me, you get superior foliage color all through the, all through the seasons, especially here over the winter, we would have that nice color just like the picture shows. Uh, a couple plants probably like, oh wow, boring. You put an azalea and a roadie on there. Um, you know, when you're looking for spring color, everybody who lives up here knows we've got thousands of choices for roadies and azaleas. I mean, that's never going to change. But if I'm looking at making a choice, you know, why not get one that gives me more than one season of interest? You know, if you came to me and said, I'd like a red azalea, I would try to steer you something towards Johanna because not only does it have a great classic red flower like all the rest of the azaleas in spring, when I get to winter time, my foliage color turns burgundy. So now I've got an added season of interest to me that pops in the landscape. I have a few different azaleas um, in my own yard in Everett and all of mine will turn color for the winter. Because again, I want to come home. We have so much green here, you know, as a background, as our native areas. And to come home and see something red or burgundy popping against that color uh, to me, it looks sharp all winter. So look at varieties like Johanna, Gerard's Fuchsia. There's a number of different azaleas that would give you that winter color uh, as an added bonus. On the right is old PJM rhododendron. You know, that's an indestructible roadie. Um, I have one on my south facing bank. I can grow it in sun, I can grow it in shade, and grow it just about anywhere, to be honest with you. There's a lot of good cultivars of PJM now, but that picture with that dark purple mahogany color is literally taken in the dead of winter. You know, that's a plant that's green in the growing season, but now I would have that added foliage interest and those bloom again, right at the end of winter. So PGM is one of the earlier bloomers. Typically we would have flowers on that by sometime in March on a typical year. Uh, more evergreens, 
On the left there is Daphne. Um, you know, winter Daphne is a bloomer that we would have flowers on in February, March, even into April. Um, great variegated evergreen foliage, nice fragrant flower. There's a lot of good varieties out there like Majima. We have some Rebecca, which has got a lot of yellow. Uh, we tend to go for the nice variegated foliages and again, the fragrant winter flower. You know, Daphne, so that particular Daphne, you would want to plant on the east side of your house, ideally, perhaps not have it any afternoon sun. And if you've had Daphne and I have a couple, make sure you've got good drainage. That is the one thing we have to have with Daphne's is the water going through the soil and not getting too wet, particularly over the winter time. Um, on the right is a plant called Distillium. Um, that's not maybe a plant everybody's seen. Uh, it's getting way more popular up here in the Northwest. Um, there's a lot of good varieties and a lot of options for variety. So tall, tall up, head style distilliums to low spreading kind of ground eater distilliums. <coughs> if you can think of that plant, it's essentially an evergreen witch hazel, which we'll show witch hazel here when we get to deciduous. But that's a plant that would bloom with those spidery red witch hazel type, witch hazel type flowers in the dead of the winter. So I walk out after Christmas in January, February, I'm going to see some flower on that on an evergreen. This particular one uh, shown here is one called Cinnamon Girl. So you can see I've got some purpley, bronzy color. It's a nice bushy low grower, but you'll see quite a few varieties out um, here at Sunnyside in the winter and the spring as we go through the seasons. You know, think of this as perhaps a laurel substitute. I'm not a huge laurel fan. And if I want to have a low, you know, autoleucan type plant, I could choose something like Cinnamon Girl. I can clip it if I want. I've got no disease. I've got no insects. This grows in sun and shade, clay, rock, sand. Um, I wouldn't use the word indestructible on many plants, but uh, Distillium is an easy plant to grow. A couple of different holly-like plants. On the left is an Osmanthus Goshiki, which has got great variegation. There's one behind me here too in the little garden I made. Um, that's something that's evergreen that would give me all kinds of foliage color. You know, it's clippable, maintainable. I can use it as a specimen, a foundation plant. Great for sun or part shade. Um, but it looks like holly, but it's not holly. So I'm not going to have the berries, the seedlings, some of the times the issues we get with ho typical hollies around here. Osmanthus will give me that color, the texture that I want, but just not have the berries. Um, <coughs> excuse me, on the right is one called Scallywag. It's kind of the pirate holly, we call it, right? So Scallywag's kind of a fun plant. Um, that's a male holly, so again, no berries on it. I can certainly use it as a pollinator if I want the berries on a female variety. But Scallywag is a nice short, small shrub, just about three feet by three feet. Um, it's starting to turn color in the picture there, but if you saw that in a landscape in the dead of winter, that would have all of its leaves, but look bright, dark purple. So that's one that I would have all foliage color on, but not lose my leaves in the winter. A couple of more fragrant ones. Uh, we're not going to make you spell Sarcococa. That one's got way too many C's and way too many vowels. So you can call this sweet box, you can call it a bunch of different names. It's got a few, a few floating out there. The point is, if I've got shade, I want easy, even dry, and I want evergreen and fragrant flowers. These are little guys that will bloom all through after the holidays into spring. Your whole backyard will smell, mine does every year. And I've got some height options is the only difference in these plants. So a plant like Humulus, is what we would really call sweet box. That's the, to me, the best foundation plant for shade. You know, I want something just a couple feet tall that I don't have to prune. It's evergreen, it's easy. I don't have to water it a lot. I've got dry shade underneath my four foot eaves at the old house in Everett. And this is a plant I've got all around the different areas underneath those eaves because I don't have to water it much year round and I get great smell. We open the sliding door February, March, April, the whole, whole house will smell like that sweet vanilla, the great color. Is my internet okay now, Nicole? <laughs> okay. Uh, Russifolia on the right is a taller variety. So that's one that we would want maybe to use in the background for the shade. Something I might get up there in that four to five foot range. Certainly can prune it, but I've got a couple of options as far as sizes. 
The one I didn't put on there is Confusa. So now I've got two foot. I've got Confusa at that three, maybe three and a half foot. And then I have Russifolia uh, up there in the four to five foot range. So three options for three heights on a great, great, great plant for winter. Uh, Lakota way, uh, that's one called Scarletta there. You can see that's got great color. That is in the winter again. You know, that's a plant that gets red, doesn't lose its leaves. It's a nice tidy little one for that part shade, part sun. Uh, coast Lakota way is a native here up and down the Pacific coast. So you can kind of call it native, although it's not the native variety you would find out hiking. But it certainly grows like that. Very easy. Doesn't need a lot of water. Can be pruned if you want. Uh, that gets a nice white flower in the springtime. But again, for our winter class here, that would be a really nice pop of foliage color uh, to utilize over the winter. Uh, soft caress Mahonia, and we'll do a couple more Mahonias here in the next slide. You know, Mahonia, Oregon grape is a native. These are, these are cultivars. This is not native uh, Northwest Oregon grape. Uh, soft caress is a media cross. Uh, from a, a species in China mixed with our Oregon grape. Um, that does not have the spiny leaves like typical Oregon grape if you if you have that plant. It's a much softer texture, soft caress, great name. Um, that is blooming here pretty quick. That's one of the first ones to bloom. Typically in our area, I would see soft caress blooming in November into December. Um, if you want to keep the hummingbird happy, that would be one of his favorite little nectar sources to, to use over the winter. Uh, you've got the sugar feeder out. That would be a, a natural nectar source for a flower that you can utilize uh, to keep the hummingbirds uh, cooking all winter. Uh, Polygala um, is a plant we'll get in a little bit later in winter. We might have a couple left now. Um, but that's a little kind of ground hugger. Um, that smells great. It's got the University of Washington Husky colors going to it here. Um, yellow with purple. Um, you might find those around a little bit. It's kind of a relative in that pea family, uh, but something that keeps its leaves, stays low, that blooms continuously kind of late winter through spring and a lot of times again in the summer. Um, it's not something you would probably notice. It's not a big shrub, but if you've got a spot to kind of tuck something cool in, uh, polygala is an uncommon plant, but I think certainly something worth, uh, worth looking at. Uh, on the right is your is your standard Pierres. You know, we call it Andromeda, Lily of the Valley Shrub. That one's got too many names, honestly. Um, I put that on there for two reasons. One, that's a picture from spring. You know, that blooms typically up here in March, April. Um, I put it on because, A, you've got variegated foliage, something like Passion Frost. Again, with all the greens we have around here, why not have a pop of silver on my green? I still get my nice spring bloom like a lot of Pierres, but something I can enjoy the flower color. The other thing is with Pierre's, and I'll show you one after the slideshow, is they've already set their flower buds. So to me, that's one of the coolest shrubs for the harbinger of spring to come. You know, I'm, it's all gray and I'm bummed out in the winter and it's rained for 40 straight days. And I'm like, when is spring coming? And you can look out at your Pierre's and see all those flower buds sitting there waiting to open come March. So right now the plants, have the foliage color, have all the flower buds sitting there ready to go, and then we get to enjoy the, enjoy the color coming out of winter. A uh, couple heathers, <clears throat> you know, on the left, we've got the Scottish uh, Kalunas, like Firefly, Winter Chocolate, Wickwar Flame, you know, we can go on and on. The Kaluna varieties will typically bloom in the summer, but give me the oranges, the limes, the yellows, the reds, the bright colorful foliage, over the winter. So if you come down this time of year, you'll see a lot of them uh, turning, starting to turn their color for winter. Then next summer I get the flower and then we have that cycle kind of two seasons of interest to me. On the right is the Irish heaths. So the Ericas, uh, we have those on special right now, uh, five for 40 in gallons. We go through hundreds of them in the fall, but they're just about ready to start blooming. You know, typical Ericas, whether I go white, light pink, dark pink, there's a lot of varieties around for flower. Um, those will all bloom here starting in fall, usually later October, November, and go all the way through the winter into March and April. So you can get a really nice long season of bloom on a very hardy plant that we don't have to worry about with, with, uh, with winter damage. Okay, now we'll talk about some deciduous things. Let me see what time it is. Okay, plenty. Uh, deciduous plants, you know, if, if the, the funny word deciduous, most gardeners just means, that means I drop my leaves for the winter. You know, 
I have foliage all season. We get cold, the seasons change. I turn color and then I drop my foliage and become bare for the winter, leaf back out the next spring. So a few deciduous things here. Uh, oak leaf hydrangea um, is a spectacular fall color plant. You know, we've still got a few around. Um, that's one, if you haven't tried one in your yard, I get a nice white bloom in the summer, but this is the time of year where I've got big foliage shaped like an oak leaf that I would have yellows, oranges, red, purple, uh, just about every color in the rainbow for fall. Uh, PG hydrangea, uh, we talked about in our hydrangea class here a couple months back, but right now, you know, yes, the leaves will turn some color, but I'm getting interest on the flowers here. You know, those are starting to turn darker rose into reds. I know my little lime in my landscape looks spectacular right now. It's still got green leaves, but I've got the flower color to enjoy. Then we go dormant for the winter after we turn color and then right back into springtime. Uh, some berries, you know, snowberry is our native snowberry. I uh, was white. Uh, you've got a lot of kind of man-made varieties now. If you want a little tidier plant um, and a heavy one, the birds will love you for having these as we go into winter. Uh, these two varieties are from Bailey Nurseries uh, back in Minnesota that we carry. Uh, Galaxy's got the white flower. Candy has or the white berry, excuse me. Candy has the pink one. Uh, both those are very easy plants to grow. You know, if I've got sun or, or, parts, or parts sun, I got nice foliage. Uh, yes, I turned some color on the leaves. I've got the berries that persist a little bit into the early winter time, but a great one for fall. You know, right now, um, I know mine is just covered with berries when it's wet and rainy today, like today, they'll even be hanging down a little bit, uh, but certainly a very cool plant for, for fall interest. A uh, couple of more deciduous plants here, Aronia, uh, we call choke cherry. Uh, that's a plant that's more native on the East Coast, but very usable here in the Pacific Northwest. Um, Aronia used to be a monster. You know, if we plant a choke cherry, that's a big plant. You know, I had to give up a pretty good chunk of my yard for a tall shrub, frankly, even a, a small tree as far as shape. Uh, the hybridizing done back on the East Coast, uh, I think it was Maine Botanical Garden. Um, they've developed some great low ones. You've got lowscape, we've got lowscape hedger. Um, that's, that's a picture blooming that we would see in like May, June. They would get a really nice, a little berry on them right now in the fall, the birds would love. I would turn great reds, oranges, and the purple range for fall color, go dormant for the winter, and then be right back again uh, come springtime. Uh, those are super hardy. If you want something uh, pretty bulletproof, that would be a good choice to consider. On the right is sumac. Uh, we see those more in eastern Washington, Idaho, Montana, maybe a little hotter, drier climate. Um, they grow certainly very well here um, in our Puget Sound garden is, gardens as well. Uh, Tiger Eyes is a variety, again, from Bailey's that I like. We've done staghorn sumac. There's all kinds of varieties. But Tiger Eyes would give me that color you're looking at all through the growing season. And now that I get to fall, I get my orange, my red, my brighter color. So if I like that lime yellow color, uh, sumac would be a great choice for all season foliage to me as well as some, some fun fall color coming on here now. A uh, couple of winter bloomers. Uh, Contorted filbert, many of you may have in your yard. Um, I chose black dragon perhaps to show you. Um, you've probably seen the green leafed ones around. Uh, that picture would have been taken about late, mid, late February. So you can see the breaking bud. They're gonna drop those little catkin flowers in late winter for some interest. I like Black Dragon because it's going to have the purple foliage on it. Comes out dark, stays with some green, with some red all summer, turns nice color for fall. The other benefit with Black Dragon is that's a newer cultivar out of Oregon that is immune to filbert blight. So if you've had issues with filbert blight, you live by a green belt, you've tried filbert, it's, it's crashed out, this is one we wouldn't have to worry about uh, any kind of disease on. On the right is uh, Pink Dawn Viburnum. Uh, those are still holding on to their leaves right now. They will turn great fall color here in the red burgundy range uh, going into winter. And then that blooms in the dead of winter. So you will see pink on viburnum flower starting November, December, January, February, all into March. A lot of times some flowers come out, another, another clump come out, another clump come out. If you've had this plant, you know what I mean? Uh, they bloom for a pretty good, pretty good season here over the dormant, dormant time and they smell incredible. If I want fragrance, Pink Dawn Viburnum's got awesome scent. 
Um, and that's a big plant. You know, make sure if you're choosing this one, we're giving it some room to grow. We're not going to prune this with the chainsaw into a little three foot ball. This is when we've got to get some structure and some upright habit. You know, I see old pink dawn viburnums, you know, honestly up in the eight, 10, maybe even 12 foot range as you get a very old one, but we would have that multi-stem, you know, kind of vase shaped deciduous plant that we can use for some height and get some awesome winter flower and fragrance from. A uh, couple more winter bloomers, a uh, Chinese paper bush, or we, we also call it Edgeworthia. Uh, that's a plant obviously from China. Uh, that's a plant that would bloom in the dead of winter. So we have some paper bush down right now, uh, the yellow flowering. Uh, they will turn color, drop their leaves. And when there's no foliage on that, in that January, February time frame, we would see the fragrant flowers of the paper bush come out. Um, you can find, perhaps if you're a hunter, I'm hoping we have a few come after winter, uh, orange and red flowering ones as well, but typically you will see the yellow around here at Sunnyside for sure. Uh, buttercup winter hazel, I wanna make sure I say that twice, that's winter hazel, not witch hazel, those are two different plants. Winter hazel is Coriolopsis, uh, that's a plant that we would see again flowering in February into March. So we would turn pretty yellow color here in the fall, drop our, all our leaves, then we would have those spectacular yellow flowers drop down here uh, coming out in that mid to late winter time frame. Uh, Buttercup is a much tidier variety. I chose to put that on for most gardens. That's a manageable size, um, Coriolopsis, the Spectata, or the spike winter hazel is the taller one that would probably eat up a good eight feet by eight feet. Uh, buttercup, you could easily keep half that size, you know, in the four by four, by four range. Uh, Father Gila uh, is, a, is a great fall color plant. You know, if I was to try and rank number one, number two, three, that's always going to be in my top three favorites. I love Father Gila, and I think it's a plant a lot of people don't. Uh, know about or using their gardens, honestly, uh, I'm going to have a kaleidoscope of fall color. You know, when I have Father Gilla, I've got yellow, orange, red, purple, and every shade in between. Uh, that's a plant that turns spectacular here for fall and is really easy to grow. Got a nice green leaf in the season and a fragrant white flower stock that comes up in May, June. So to me, that's another shrub underutilized, I think, up here that's got multiple seasons of interest as well. Uh, Hypericum, I put pumpkin on there. Uh, Hypericum you might recognize as a, a plant a lot of people grow as a ground cover, St. John's wort, uh, that does take over a little bit as a ground cover. The shrub's very tidy. Um, there's a lot of color options. This is one we sell a lot of to people that like to clip branches, use them in bouquets, bring them indoors. Pumpkin's obviously gonna have an orange berry on it. A lot of people call these floral berries. We would have orange berries to use in fall arrangements. You can find red, black, white, pink, any shade, honestly. Uh, we've got a few still left around here in some colors, but certainly you can kind of personalize those with your own style. You know, what color berry would you like? They're always gonna bloom yellow, but then we would have that uh, late summer flower and then the berry development in the fall, depending on, on what color you like. Uh, Japanese beauty berry. Uh, is a plant from Japan, obviously, that's Calicarpa. Uh, that's another tall shrub uh, that right now is, is you know, you, sometimes the pictures are a little washed out, but that is a shiny metallic purple berry. That's a, a beautiful plant here over the winter. You know, when that turns yellow and drops its leaves, I'm left to look at all the clusters of those shiny purple berries here going through the winter into the holidays. Um, that's another tall plant. You know, don't think you can prune that thing into a little shrub. We want to give that some room to grow and develop some structure, you know, up there in that maybe eight to 10 foot tall range as we get a little bit older. Uh, nine bark I took in the snow. Uh, that's from my house a few years back. Um, I have one on my bank that I haven't touched in probably 10 years, to be honest with you. If you want indestructible, drought tolerant, don't have to mess with it. Nine bark's a great tall deciduous plant. I chose the winter picture because that will show you all the peely bark. Um, that looks pretty cool, you know, over the winter time when we've got that cinnamon, white, browns, all the peely bark at the base. Typically grows as a multi-stem uh, shrub again, although we have them as trees if you want a single trunk here. Um, nine bark is a, a plant you could pick a lot of foliage colors. They all turn great color in the fall, 
then I've got the winter interest with the bark. But I could I could have dark red, purplish, orangish, yellowish all season, and then turn the color in the fall. So I could have a few different options as far as my summer foliage on those. Uh, twig dogwoods. Um, I think everybody lives up around our neck of the woods has seen twig dogwoods. You know, that's a great wetland plant. You'll see native ones here growing in ditches, sloughs, wetland areas. Um, you know, red twig, yellow twig, and I'll, we'll simplify it and call it orange twig. You know, I can call any three of those colors I want, and I've got a, a different options as far as size and foliage on them. Uh, Midwinter fire, I've got a big one in my front bank. You know, years ago, again, I wanted to drive home in the winter and see the, the twig color. So years ago, I planted midwinter fire, a yellow twig and a red twig about three feet apart. And I just let them grow together into a big bird thicket, I call it. The birds hide out in there um, in the summer for shelter. I've got berries for them to eat. It's a great native type plant. Um, but in the winter time, when all the leaves are gone, I drive by and I've got color. You know, it looks spectacular tw twig color over the cold months. Um, you know, these can be pruned. You don't have to let them get big. In my spot, I wanted it a little bigger, uh, but they can be pruned a little bit too. And there are some there are some good dwarf ones, especially on the red twig side. Um, Neon burst is one. Again, that's in the winter with the red, but that would have yellow foliage all season. So I've got that contrast of the yellow lime foliage on red twigs spring, summer, fall. Then I've got the bright reds to live with here over the winter. <coughs> oh, witch hazel. Uh, that's my tree inside my fence. Uh, witch hazel is a plant uh, that blooms in the dead of the winter. This is Arnold Promise, uh, which is yellow and smells good. A lot of people, I think, um, think witch hazel all has fragrance. The yellows are going to have the superior fragrance. You can also get orange and red flower color, but if we want smell, we want yellow. So we typically get mostly Arnold Promise. Uh, we also get Helena is a good orange one. Diane's a good red one. We'll have those on occasion. They're all spectacular bloomers. I don't care how cold it is. You can see the snow. doesn't matter how cold. You know, like clockwork, I can look out in my yard in mid-January, and I can see all the yellow flowers starting on the Arnold Promise, and that persists all the way into the early springtime, late March, early April. Um, I could have also put a fall color picture on there, because again, this would be up in my top five or 10 for fall color on the foliage. This has got the yellow, the red, the orange, a mix of all of them, a great fall color plant that would bloom in the winter. Um, size, you need to give this room to grow. You know, again, we're not gonna take the chainsaw on the stick and prune this into a little ball in our front yard. This is going to be a large shrub slash small tree. I would, I would expect Arnold to get, you can see the multi-stem vase shape to it, you know, up there in the 12, maybe 15 foot range, tall and wide as we get older. We can certainly keep it narrower with some pruning by taking some branches out, but give it some room to grow. It's a spectacular little small tree. Uh, Cornelian cherry uh, is in the dogwood family. Uh, the Brits call it Cornelian cherry. We call it Cornus moss. Uh, it would have the bright yellow flowers again coming out late winter and that would get a little red oblong cherry on it in the summertime. So it's in the dogwood family. It's a little different looking dogwood than most of us are used to in the Northwest, but certainly a nice sizable uh, tree for most landscapes. You know, you're not gonna get 30, 40, 50 feet. You know, a good old Cornelian cherry, you know, might get you in the 15 by 15 range and something again, we can prune pretty easily. Uh, lots of Japanese maples. The regulars here know I'm the maple freak. I have Acer palmatomitis. That's one of the many contagious diseases I have. Just kidding. Uh, so I put a couple on here just because I wanted you to see a twig color. So if we look at the two that I popped on the screen, Bihu uh, is one from Japan that would translate beautiful mountain range. Uh, that's got a lot of the yellow to orangey with a little touch of coral color twigs. That is one I have to have in shade. I want to make sure that's clear. Bihu is one I could have morning sun or shade. I don't want that guy cooking in the afternoon. It's great in the one for containers too. That doesn't get super big, but certainly something that's attractive all season. And I've got the bonus of that bark color in the wintertime. 
<coughs> a coral bark, <coughs> excuse me, a coral bark on the right is a typical one I think a lot of gardeners see. Um, spectacular twig color in the winter. I mean, if you've got a coral bark, you know what I mean. Um, I want to make sure you consider two things when you choose a coral bark maple because it's a great plant to add to your landscape, but a size. I think most people think Japanese maple, again, is this little, small, tiny thing I can keep tiny. If I buy Sangu Kaku, the original coral bark, you know, that is one of the largest Japanese maples. I would expect you to have a 25-foot tree down the road. If that's too big for you and you like the color of the twigs, come springtime, we'll have a lot of good dwarfs. There's Benikawa, there's Winter Flame, Akakawa Hime. Um, if you look on our maple list on the website, you'll see some other options for dwarf coral barks. So now I can get down there 15 feet, 10 feet, Akakawa Hime, you know, I think you could easily keep that in the six to eight foot range. So the same great twig color that you would see on the tall tree, but choose your variety wisely. You don't want to let that guy get too big. A couple larger trees uh, that you would get some great bark interest on over the winter for, for added interest. Uh, Himalayan white birch. You know, we see birch around a lot of parts of the country, uh, but whether it's paper birch, which will peel cinnamon, this is the Jackmontii or Himalayan white birch. I would have that beautiful chalk white color. You know, again, with all the evergreens we have in Washington um, and a lot of areas of the country as well, we would see that bright bark just shine through the winter time. You know, birch is a big plant. Do not plant this by your front porch. Do not plant it on your septic system. Do not plant it near a water line. Uh, you know, birch is a water lover and you have to give it some room to grow. So if you've got some room and I'm looking for a large shade tree, you know, something that would get 40 feet, you know, down the road with nice color, great yellow fall color. You know, maybe look at some birches. That's a great option. Uh, Stewardia uh, is one of my favorite plants of any kind for trees. You know, that to me is the ultimate tree for all seasons. You can see that beautiful bark colors, kind of patchy, little calico, cinnamon, grays, browns. Um, it's got no disease or insect, easy plant to grow that blooms in the summer, which is a different time for a lot of flowering trees. They call it pseudo camellia tree. So it looks like a big white camellia flower with the yellow center in it. Great summer bloom and absolutely stunning red to purple fall color. So I've got all the seasons covered with Stewardia. If you've got room uh, for again, a little bit larger tree in the landscape, Stewardia is a great choice uh, for a tree specimen to me. Japanese is the tall one. I'll probably get up there in the 30, 40 foot range. They grow pretty slow. Um, you can also look at Korean Stewartia uh, is a much, about half that size. Uh, we get those in every spring as well. And there's another one called Monadelpha, or they call tall Stewartia that will get me up, but not get me this way. So if I want the accent vertically with the cool bark, but I don't want as much spread, you may, you may look at the Monadelphas. We would have those in spring as, as well. Uh, paper bark maple, you can see the bright shiny uh, brown bark on that. It's a great small size shade tree. You know, that's got nice fall color on it, great green leaves all, all summer, uh, but spectacular in the wintertime with that exfoliating bark. Uh, Pacific fire vine maple uh, is a plant we sell quite a few of these days because everybody likes the vine maple, the native look. All as I've done is added um, a, a bark color. So if I look at that here over the winter, I'm going to have that stripey, corally bark on it to add some interest to the garden on a similar size and plant to our native vine maple. Uh, just a few kind of color things for winter. Um, if you were at my fall container class, we talked about pansies and violas. You know, if I want bloom in my pot, in my border, in my landscape, it is pansy and viola here in the winter. You know, I don't care how cold it gets. They freeze up, look like little shiny ice cubes, you know, when it's frosty. And then two days later when it warms up, here come the flowers again. Um, pansies and violas are the way you're going to add color pop to the landscape and, and a lot of flower power. Uh, we'll, do, we'll do bulb class here tomorrow, so I won't spend a lot of time on bulbs. But uh, there's some great blooming bulbs that would be out in January and February. Crocus. Um, orange crocus, purple crocus, yellow, blues, whites, lavenders, a lot of options for a very low filler. I have a lot of crocus in my yard because 
I think it's an easy filler for under plants. You can see the flower when there's no foliage on and then boom, pop out uh, for the next season again. Uh, I use a lot of aconites um, in the shade garden at my house in different areas. Um, that's one that will be the first one to bloom. I have those usually in flower by mid-January in my own yard. Great yellow color on a nice low, like four inches tall is all that is. A uh, couple perennials. If you haven't tried Mukdinia, that's kind of a fun one to say. Um, you know, that's a very cool perennial. They're just about going dormant here for the winter, <clears throat> but that's fall color. You know, I've got a nice woodland shade perennial that looks like almost Japanese maple foliage. That Crimson Fans has got spectacular red uh, color here for the fall. That will go dormant and nothing in the winter, but then pop right back up come springtime. I always put anemones on because uh, many of the anemones, including mine, bloom well into the fall until we get hard frost. So a lot of times in the September, October, November time range, anemones will give you a really nice pop of color. I put wild swan on because that's the one variety I've tried that starts in early summer and goes off and on all the way through fall instead of just in the fall. Uh, hookahs, I have hookahitis too. That's a, a disease that I named years ago. I couldn't tell you how many I have in my yard. I have both of those. Those are from my landscape, the pictures. Um, there's a lot of hookahs. You know, if I want evergreen perennial, the color, the texture, in pots, borders, sun, shade, you know, we can help you find a hookah for any spot in your landscape. And I can choose everything from green with white to almost black purple. There is a zillion uh, options for nice, easy hookahs to grow. Uh, hellebores, we'll have a hellebore class, I think, hopefully here coming up still this fall. We're still deciding if we're going to do that one. Uh, but hellebores are the winter jewel. You know, if I've got hellebore in my yard, I've got evergreen foliage. I'm going to bloom uh, through the winter months, depending on your variety. Some start November, December. Other ones pop up in January, February. <clears throat> this is the time of year, you know, if you wait about a month and you go down to Sunnyside, this is the time of year you're going to find maximum selection. You know, if I want to look at all the flower options, singles, doubles, spotted, painted, all kinds of options, uh, pop down in the nursery here in about a month, we would have a we bet you we probably have 30, 40 varieties of hellebores around here for sale. There's a couple other ones, Penny's Pink and Anna's Red. Those were new last year. Uh, Epimediums um, is another great kind of evergreen perennial. I use these a lot in my yard behind plants, shade and dry. These are things you don't have to water. They eat up ground, but not super invasive. Um, the flower you can see comes out. We can get other varieties, different colors. That would be blooming right coming late winter, so like February and March. But I've always got that foliage color. Mine will turn red over the winter and just sit there. They don't go dormant. They don't turn brown. If I choose to start them over, I can take the hedge clippers out, lay it on the ground, and just cut the stems back to the ground in like early February. Then I can really see all the flowers and we start over again. We've got the fresh foliage the next season. I don't do that every year, but probably every three years I'm like, all right, let's start you over again, give you a little cut back coming out of winter, and then we've got a fresh plant again starting over. Euphorbias, um, very drought tolerant, good for sun, nice foliage color. Um, I tend to use these in a lot of pots. Um, some people use them in the landscape as well. They work great. Kind of be careful a little bit with them going to seed. Uh, is the reason I tend to go pot so I can manage the flower a little bit better. Uh, but lots of options for euphorbias. I can get anything from blue, silver. You can see Rudolph with the red tips, the rainbow with the yellow. Um, we've got a number of different euphorbias around here for the fall, winter months. Uh, grasses, you know, a lot of the grasses go dormant. We had grass class a few months back, but don't forget about sedges. Um, I use, again, a lot of them in my containers and borders of my garden because I want the texture I want the, the flow, the wind a little bit, and the bright color. You know, grasses a lot of times, this is what it looks like all winter. We're not gonna go brown. We're not gonna go dormant. I'm gonna have the yellow, the lime, the silver, orange sedge is kind of a limey orange color. I've got that all through the season. A couple last grasses um, that would be turning right now. You know, these are a couple of my favorites. A uh, little blue stem uh, is gonna get every color in the rainbow, you know, starting midsummer 
get a nice flower plume, and I'm going to have that persist here into early winter. That will go brown eventually. I'd cut that off at the ground either late fall or early spring, and we start over again. We've got a brand new plant. The andropogon uh, red October is one of the best ones if you like the dark red to purple color in the fall, and that gets much taller. You know, if I want a big six foot plus specimen grass that's got some color, some motion here for fall, that's a great one to, to take a look at as well. Uh, Wintergreen I put in because again, if we want a little ground cover, we've got woodland garden, we've got some shade, that's got great evergreen leaves, turns a little red on the foliage in the winter, but I've got those really nice berries to give me a little bit of added winter interest as well, okay? So there you go. That's a way too many plants in 45 minutes or so. Um, certainly, I just want to mention a couple things and we'll do some questions here. Um, as usual, for the classes here, we're gonna, we got a little special going. So if you want to come down today, it won't rain all day, I promise. But starting today, all the way through next Friday, uh, we would have all the outdoor plants on 20% off. So we've still got some great choices around. A lot of the stuff I showed here in the slideshow, as well as other things on the list. Um, if you want to come down and get some fall planting done, it's a great time to plant. And just let them know you were at the class at the register. We hit a magic button and you've got your 20% off uh, all outdoor plants. So that's an easy one. Um, if you caught, you know, the video part of it showed up late. You want to check up on it, watch it again. Uh, you like looking at my shiny bald head? You can jump on the net here pretty quick um, and watch it. We'll, we'll edit the video here and have it up on our website so you can always go back and reference a slide or take a look if there's something that caught your eye, okay? Um, I would just suggest a couple things coming up. Tomorrow I'll be in here at 11 a.m. doing a class on bulbs. So all the spring blooming bulbs, I'll be planting a container that I use at my house, bring one of my pots up um, and plant a, a bulb container. You can watch that as well. But it's a fun class if you're looking for a little pop of color coming into, coming into springtime. Um, the next Saturday, the 17th, I believe it is, um, I'll be doing putting the garden to bed. So we'll go through some procedures and techniques on kind of how to get your garden ready for the winter time. You know, a little bit of everything. Um, and with that, I think we'll turn it over to Nicole and we'll do some questions. Thanks everybody for jumping on. So I know we're cutting close on time. So if you have to leave, you know, we, like Trevor said, we appreciate you joining us. And again, this will be recorded and posted so you can catch the videos later. Um, Trevor, can you talk a little bit about fall planting things yep. um, that you need to be mindful of right now yep. and how to go about it? If, you know, fall planting, um, honestly, you could plant anything this time of year. You know, if you can find it, it's a great time to A, a lot of times get a special price, and B, get it in the ground to get roots established so you're that much ahead for next year. I always kind of chuckle if we had a magic camera, you know, a foot down the soil next to the plant you grew, you would think, well, what's he going to do all winter? It's going to get frosty. It's going to get cold. A lot of root development happens over the winter. Um, I try to talk people in, especially if you've got slopes or you've got areas in the corners that you maybe can't get to as easy during the growing season to water, you know, fall is a great time to get those areas attacked and planted because I'm going to be that much far ahead of the watering schedule for next summer when we get dry again. Um, I would always use Sure Start. You know, when you plant, you know, get a third compost, mix it in your hole with your native dirt, depending on your soil structure, and put a little compost down around it. We want to feed with some Sure Start beneath the plant, and I will usually put a little rim around the top before I put my mulch over it. That gentle fertilizer organic will get the root system kicking and have you a very happy plant come springtime. Is there a cutoff date when you should stop your fall planting? I'll, I'll kind of smile and chuckle as I say this. If you can get your shovel in the ground and it's not frozen, you can plant it. I've been out in January planting things before, transplanting things. This is the time of year, you know, in a month from now, as things go dormant that I can divide, I can move things, and I've got till about early March. My perennials, hostas, I mean, the list goes on and on. If the ground's frozen, yeah, wait, you know, wait a couple days. You know, we're not ever gonna be that cold up around here. Uh, maybe it happens for two, three days. If the ground is, is thawed and I can put a shovel in, I can plant. 
What about in terms of planting in containers? Um, there were two questions about container planting, specifically uh, a maple in a container, a Japanese maple, and then a Hinoki cypress. Is now a good time? Should you wait until spring? No, I, I can still do any kind of container planting. As long as I've got a good frost-proof pot, I'm not going to worry about the winter time. Um, sometimes terracotta, plastic, maybe not quite as durable, but if I've got a nice size container and I want to transplant things, move them out of pots into my yard, you can kind of go both ways. You can do that again uh, pretty much year round. Um, I would absolutely attack it. I mean, I'll speak for me. I've been kind of busy with some house projects here, building a new fence for a couple of weeks. I haven't even popped my pansies in. So I'm still in the next couple of weeks going to be revamping my summer containers, adding pansies, grasses, different textures that I can enjoy all winter. And I'm, I, I, I would say you've still got, you know, weeks to go in and do that. <laughs> if you're going to do pansies, in particular, I try to get mine in before the end of October usually. A, you can't find them much here come November. They will be out and most nurseries will not have them. But B, I want to let them get a little bit of roots, start to get acclimated outside so that I have that consistent bloom all through the winter time. Do you need to worry about drainage at all with the, you know, winter rains being in a pot? Yeah. Well, drainage, if, if you've got a pot, you, you know, it has to have drain holes in it. So you should not have to worry about a drainage. If it's sitting outside in the rain, as long as you use a good well-drained potting soil, you know, not to knock miracle Grow, but don't buy the moisture control, uh, chemicalized potting soils. They hold too much moisture. We have Edna's Best, a nice organic from E.B. Stone. If I use that from my potting mix, I'm all, it can rain every day all winter and the water is still going to go through the container I'm not going to have to worry about drainage issues. What about, uh, sorry, kind of shifting gears, the dogwood, are those deer and elk resistant? Uh, dogwoods will get nibbled on by deer a little bit. I hate to say um, that would not be one of mine for, for deer elk resistant. Um, I'll, I'll say this about the dog, twig dogwoods, um, or the tree for that matter, you know, the, the, they grow pretty fast, you know, and I don't mind sharing um, you know, our family's had a place in Clay Island for years. I got twig dogwood all over the place. They'll come in, prune it for me in the winter, and then up it comes next spring and off we go again. Uh, but it's certainly one they would browse on. Uh, I believe towards the beginning you talked about grevilleas and yep. the question is how close to the water should they be? There's somebody who lives uh, like less than a mile from the yep. waterfront. She's wondering. Um, it, it's not so much that they have to be close to the water. I, 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 maybe I mis misspoke a little bit. It's just as you tend to live, you know, in the, in the marine climate down there, close to the coast, you know, down in Everett, Mukilteo, Edmonds, we could go right down. You tend not to get maybe quite as cold as up as us up in the thousand, you know, two thousand foot elevation. So it's not that you have to be on the coast, although they take salt spray. You can grow them right on the beach. Um, Revelia is just one I worry about hardiness a little bit. And if I was up in you know Skycomish or up in the hills here in Arlington, I probably wouldn't have the best of luck growing a Revelia unless I crossed my fingers and got kind of lucky here for a few years. But down in town. You know, sea level, sheltered spots, um, very, you get a little, little bit of hardiness. Uh, shifting to roadies, what's the uh -huh. best kind of bark and or mulch to use for them and what's the best way to apply that? Well, if we want to get, um, you know, I, I don't care if you want to get bark. I mean, bark is going to be half the price as compost. It's all going to add acidity, which we have acidic soil and roadies are going to love anyway. Um, you know, bark, it, it, you know, it's just a personal thing. I'm not trying to talk you out of it. It's not my favorite thing. I would always go towards the compost because it's already composted bark, darker color, adds more nutrients. Um, my concern with bark on rhododendron is this. You know, if you're going to bark your yard, awesome. I would never tell you not to mulch it. And if you like bark, great. But make sure you put some fertilizer down underneath the bark. Whether it's now, you do it in spring, whatever season it is. As, as real woody bark decomposes, we're going to rob the soil of nitrogen. And a lot of people call me in spring or summer and say, man, I mulched my yard. A lot of my roadies kind of look like liney green, a little bit of yellow. It's just because that bark is decomposing. And yes, it's adding nutrients down the road. But if we have that fertilizer underneath it, um, we would have the, 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 the bark rot take that fertilizer out of there and not my soil, if that makes sense. 
does. Yeah. Thank you. Um, you talked about the icebreaker Korean fur. Uh, yep. There was a question about what, how big and why yep. does that get? And then are there dwarf of, uh, varieties available? Well, the, the Korean fur is, is a really cool plant. We've got quite a few cultivars around here. The icebreaker is the miniature version. So if I only want something that grows literally an inch, maybe two inches a year, and only gets about two, two and a half feet tall, three feet wide, that is the smallest version. If you like that texture and the silver on green color with that kind of curled needle, we would get bigger ones like Silver Star. You'll see them on my conifer list. We've got regular tree versions of that. The icebreaker would be your miniature one. What about ants on trees? How do you stop? I lost you. Ants on trees. How do you okay. stop them from wreaking havoc? Well, ants are always going to be there for some sort of sugar source. So I hate to tell you this. Um, if you've got ants crawling up and down trees, you've probably got aphids or some sort of insect that's sucking sugar out of the foliage, and they are going to be attracted to go lap that up, essentially. So you can do a lot of different things. I mean, there's, you know, you don't have to necessarily spray the whole tree. If they're climbing up and down the trunk, you might think about getting just a small band of tree wrap. You could apply some tangle foot or a paste to that. It won't hurt the tree that they'll get stuck in, but won't be able to crawl up. That'd be an easy choice. Um, or certainly there's a number of different sprays. It doesn't have to be murder, death, kill, systemic. We can get some options of something a little more natural that would take care of ants as well as a lot of other bugs as well. But I would try to tell you, look real close up in that tree crown. I can almost guarantee scale, aphid, some sort of insect is up there that you do want to get rid of that's probably sucking sugar out of the foliage and leaving their frass for the ants to be attracted to. We've covered a lot of ground. We're about out of time. So if we didn't get to your questions, shoot us an email. We'd be happy to answer it that way at sunnysidenursery at msn.com. Again, we really appreciate everybody for joining us today and we hope to see you around the nursery. Yes. Thank you, everybody. Hopefully we'll see you tomorrow for bulbs.